Unfortunately, it can be very easy to take advantage of people who were traumatized as kids and make them think that some uncomfortable or painful or exploitative situation will lead to being loved. Now, when you haven't been loved properly, almost everyone becomes vulnerable to manipulation because love and being included is something we all want so much. We need it. And one way that manipulative people can take what they want from vulnerable people is through spiritual bypassing. They give you spiritual or ideological reasons why even though your red flag detector is flashing, you should go against your common sense and accept bad treatment, stay stuck in a bad situation, and in many cases, consent to continued exploitation. Now, I'm talking about certain religious or spiritual or new age or personal development ideas out there that are totally common and widely believed, but that are really not true. And I'm not categorically against religion and spirituality and personal development. I'm into those things. But I've seen way too many cases where people who are primed by the neglect and abuse they experienced as kids fall prey to just BS ideas. Not only manipulators, but sometimes by themselves. They tell themselves these fake ideas in order to keep hope alive that even though everything is terrible now, hope is just around the corner, it's all going somewhere good, and the worried and skeptical gut feeling inside is just a personal failing that has to be overcome. So just for a quick example, the idea that everything you experience, you created, unconsciously in your mind maybe, so that you could learn from it, all right? And I know this is an idea held very innocently by many people, just trying to take responsibility for their thoughts and not trying to manipulate anyone. But when someone has had their perception messed with, which is often the case with people with CPTSD, ideas like this can become a kind of magical thinking that leaves the door wide open to people who love to push this kind of idea so that they can take something from you, your money, your hopes for a relationship with them, and then totally let you down and tell you that you created the situation because you wanted it and they were just helping you, right? Helping. <laughs> Have you ever had someone play that game with you? Ugh. Maybe you went along with the magical thinking because, you know, thinking that you created some terrible situation is a little easier than facing that you're actually being emotionally ripped off and that the right thing to do is to get out of there because this person is an a-hole who doesn't care about you and you're both using magical thinking to keep you from seeing the obvious, which you don't want to see because it scares you, it makes you feel foolish, it threatens you with being alone. And that's the truth that you actually are alone, not loved like you hoped and were led to believe by this person, but alone back in that space. I'm here to help you develop a BS detector that enables you to, yes, learn new ideas and listen to people, but not get sucked into magical thinking that's going to cost you all your boundaries and that good open-hearted possibility of real love that is inside you. I want to show you how to protect that hope and tenderness in you because that is the very reason why someone's going to fall in love with you. Not because you're so good at thriving in bad situations, but because you are your real worthy of respect self and that you thrives in reality because that you recognizes dishonesty and instead craves truth and hears that little voice inside when something doesn't feel right that you is fed by love and goodness not unkindness and invalidation and definitely not some complicated spiritualized explanation of why it's actually good for you to be used by someone that's what spiritual bypassing is. Okay, so let's talk about a few of these toxic ideas so you can watch out for them. You hear them all the time. They tend to sound profound or like ancient wisdom, but usually a kind of counterintuitive and too good to be true element is there because it is there. It is too good to be true. So the first is when people challenge the way you're thinking or the fact that you're thinking by saying, hey, you're all up in your head, or you need to be more in your body, or you need to just breathe, or you need to be in the moment, or you're just being all left-brained about this. 
And I just want you to look at the pattern here that these all are criticisms of you. Someone who wants you to go along with something finds your need for clarity and logic difficult for them. And there's this implication that you're not evolved enough or free enough or devoted to scripture enough like they are. Do you know this kind of interaction? And when you feel criticized, when you take that hit for a moment, you're very tempted to override your own better judgments so that you can get this person's approval. So there's pressure to not be in your head. In other words, to abandon what is logical, like being careful with your money or guarded with your sexuality. It's so basic, but it's so persuasive. And this is exactly how you can be talked out of your natural sense of self-determination into doing things you do not want to do. And then even to take on feeling ashamed about any reservations you had. You don't need to feel ashamed. What's at work here is what I call crap fit. That's a word I made up for the way people who, want, who went through trauma as kids get way too good at fitting themselves to unacceptable people and situations fitting themselves, in other words, to crap, <laughs> because that's what we had to do back then, right? But now your crap fit reflex has you hiding the thoughts where you're thinking, Ugh, I don't want to sleep with this person, or Ugh, I don't think I should give them my credit card. And the only thing that makes you override these feelings is a deep down belief that you can't trust your own judgment, that other people probably know better what you should do. Okay, another form of spiritual bypassing you're right where you need to be. Now, I understand what the meaning behind this is supposed to be. Life's a journey, there's suffering, we all learn from it, that's all true. But insisting that we're always where we need to be, well, first of all, it blows up when you try to apply it to an abused child or someone spending the last 30 years of their life in front of a television. It's just obviously not true. And I wanna just tell you flat out, you have often been not at all where you need to be. When you were crying and no one came to help you as a child, that wasn't where you needed to be. When you were mocked by your classmates or crippled by your own triggers and unable to break out of isolation, you weren't where you needed to be. And in the same way, being in some so-called relationship where you don't get to have expectations, you know what I'm gonna say, it's not where you need to be. You weren't made for that. Suffering and pain are part of life and they can't be avoided entirely. And with a little grace, we can endure hardship and loss and even grow through it. But please get over this idea that being demeaned would ever be sent to you for your own good. You hear this one a lot around bad relationships. A really wonderful student of mine shared this thought once where she described a past relationship as it was really good for her, but a really hurtful relationship. And I didn't get it. And I asked her about it and she said she felt like maybe this man who treated her badly was sent by the universe so that she could learn from the experience. And I, I get it. I see the little tiny kernel of truth here that sometimes we are so far off base that it's only through a terrible experience that we will course correct and get clear about what we want. And sure, that is true sometimes, but not time after time after time. I can't tell you how many times people I've coached, people in some horrible situations where they were hoping for love, and what they got instead was to be cheated on and gaslit and left. More hurt than they were when they first met the person who treated them like that. That's not learning, and it's not a gift. It's not a mirror. It's not something from the universe. It's crap fit. That's what it is. It's you trying to make sense of absolute crap. Hiding from your own shame about it, not being straight with yourself, basically because what's getting triggered there is an abandonment wound that makes it very, very difficult to face reality and just know like it's over, I shouldn't be here. It can be very hard to deal with when you have those kind of wounds growing up. I'm telling you, if you're willing to second guess yourself about bad treatment, people who treat you badly will have a funny way of showing up at your door. If what you want is a loving, committed relationship, crap fit has no place in your life. Relationships that leave you feeling ripped off and demoralized are not learning experiences. They're crushing you. They're sabotaging the happy openness that is you, that is the only thing about you that anyone is ever going to fall in love with. You being freely yourself. Now, if you're not clear what constitutes a good person or a good relationship, 
That's got to be your first order of business because your vagueness is where the bad people get in like flies through an open screen door. You've got to get out of vagueness. You've got to be clear what your actual standards are. What kind of behaviors in other people need to be a red line? What are the green lights? One thing that used to be a problem for me, I had a blind spot around people's addictions, at first anyway. And twice I ended up in relationships with people who developed or in one case already had a serious addiction. And it was a nightmare. If you've taken my courses, you've heard the story of how my life got dragged down by that and how I eventually got myself back. And one of the most important things I did, which happened not long before I met the man I'm now married to, was I made a decision that I would never again date someone with a drug or alcohol problem. And no judgment on those of you who are struggling with addictions right now. I'm glad you're here. This is a place of recovery and you are in the right place. But I knew after I had been through so many devastating experiences with addicts and alcoholics in my family of origin and dating relationships, that for me, that had to be a red line. That's not who I was going to date anymore. I couldn't handle it. And I wrote that down. And I was almost afraid to do that because of another spiritual bypass myth that had gotten into my head and had been preventing me from being clear like that. And it was, be careful what you wish for. I didn't think I believed it, but I had absorbed this idea that some people have that you can tell the universe what you want and you'll get it, but that it's a cruel and capricious universe. Or the idea that God himself is just waiting for you to wish one wrong thing and then bam, you wanted someone who was loyal, you get a stalker. Or you wanted someone who liked adventure, oh no, she ran off with a free climber who refuses to use ropes as they climb thousand foot cliffs. You forgot to ask for the rest of it. I used to believe that. And again, I get the point that sometimes we haven't yet developed a clear picture of what we want or what's important, but God or the universe is not just sitting there waiting to F with you and teach you a lesson about your little wishes. I'm a God person, as most of you know, and if you don't believe in God, I just encourage you to translate this to some common sense that fits with your experience. But what we're created for is for good. I knew when I hit rock bottom with the second drug addict boyfriend, he died actually. And I knew that I was not at all where I was meant to be. It was a powerful and life-defining experience that if I was going to be in a relationship, it needed to support the good that was already in me and support my potential. And that I would know if a man was the right one for me by the sign that he made my life better and that I became a better version of myself. And it works two ways. I knew that the man I met would know it was good because the relationship made his life better and he became a better version of himself. And eventually that's what happened. That's what I found. I, I was never mistreated, never disrespected, never ashamed of being with him. And that's what God wants for me is to be loved and befriended and supported in becoming who I really am. And that's what I do for my husband. That's what he does for me. And here we are now. Look what's happened. I get to be here with you too. So the universe is not a slot machine. It's not amazon.com. You don't place orders and then see if you got ripped off by some sneaky deity in the sky. What I'm teaching here is that if trauma made you vulnerable and unsure of yourself, it's time to become clearer and stronger so you can live your life in a good way that leads to your own happiness and the fulfillment of all you can be, all you can bring to this great big community of life. If you wanna learn more about healing your perception when it's been damaged by trauma, you might wanna check out this video right here and I will see you very soon.